I see you browsing around looking for something interesting. You found it right here. I'm John Zadar. This is On Top and Hot, and this is the weekend of October 25th. Now, in most of my videos, what I normally do is to share a hot penny stock with you. I'm a day trader. I trade stocks under five bucks every day. But on the weekends, I like to do something different with you. I like to share my own personal trading insights, information I think that can help you. And today we're going to talk about something that seems dry, but folks, this is very critical information that affects your bottom line. We're going to talk about the wash sale rule. Now you probably haven't given it much thought, but you probably presume that everybody that trades stocks is treated the same when it comes to paying taxes. It's not true. It depends. Are you a dealer? Are you an investor or are you a trader? And did you know that you have a choice in this matter? You see, right now, most of us are being treated as if we're investors, as if we're passively trading on the market, buying a stock occasionally and holding it for years and years. Does that sound like us? No, we're day traders. Man, we're trading virtually every single day, maybe multiple times a day. So the wash sale rule, which was devised for investors, is killing us day traders. This rule was invented before high frequency trading came into effect, before the internet was launched and getting so big. So it's had a reverse effect on people who trade a lot and this can substantially change your bottom line at the end of the year. You lose tax deductions that you normally would have had with a wash sale and you normally have larger gains that you have to pay taxes on. So let's go take a closer look at exactly what is a wash sale. How does it impact you and what are your options? Can you possibly avoid wash sales? I'm going to share all that with you right now. We're going to start this off by going over to JP Morgan's website. This is where we're going to learn what a wash sale is. Generally speaking, a wash sale is when you sell a security for a loss and then within a 31 day window, you get back into the company. This is a double dipping, if you will. You're trying to take a tax loss that you're going to get at the end of the year, but then you come right back into the company trying to get a gain out of it. So you're going to have a tax loss and a gain. Uh, uh, uh. The government doesn't like that. So they came up with the wash sale rule and they buttoned this thing up really tight. So let's get some information down here, see what it is all about. The tax code generally allows investors who sell an investment at a loss to deduct that loss in determining their taxable income. But to prevent investors from abusing that tax break by selling securities held at a loss solely to recognize a tax benefit, the tax code has, for many years, included a wash sale rule, which disallows the deduction of the investor if they acquire the substantial identical security any time from 30 days before the sale to 30 days after the sale. Now, I just confused you there with some of that stuff I said, right? You understand getting out and getting back in within a 31-day window. That's pretty self-explanatory. But what do they mean by substantially identical? We're going to cover that as we move along. And what do they mean by any time from 30 days before the sale to 30 days after the sale? Is that even possible? It is when you see the big picture. I'll explain that to you too. So let's take an example here of what is going on. Generally, when you sell a stock for a gain, you know you're going to pay taxes on it capital gains, taxes, income taxes, depending how long you are holding that stock. And if you sell a stock at a loss, you expect to get a tax deduction at the end of the year. Now you do get to deduct some of your losses, some of them. You can deduct a maximum of $3,000 a year. Now let's say you lost $3 million this year. You could only deduct $3,000. The balance of that 3 million goes on indefinitely year after year at $3,000 a year. So in a thousand years, 
at $3,000 a year, you'll have recouped all of your losses. That's right. A thousand years, you'd get back all your losses. So it's not a great program, this deferment. You lose it in the front door, you lose it in the back door. It's not all that great. So let's take an example here of what this would look like. Let's say that you get into ABC manufacturing. You buy a hundred shares at a hundred dollars a share, $10,000. The stock falls 50 bucks. You lose $5,000. That is a $5,000 loss that you can deduct at the end of the year. But of course, you've got a ceiling of $3,000 in one year. You got to carry the other $2,000 over to the next year. Now, let's say three weeks down the road, the stock is at $35 and they've got a financial coming out. And you expect the financial to be really strong. So the stock you expect is going to run. So you get back into it within that 31 day window. doesn't matter if it's five minutes or 29 days, you get back into it. Now, just to keep things simple, we're going to say you buy a hundred shares at the $35 mark. So you lost $50 a share on the first transaction from $100 down to 50. Now it's dropped down to 35. You buy 100 more shares. What is your average if you buy 100 shares at $35 a share? $35, right? So why, when you go to your broker and look at your portfolio, does it say your average price, your cost basis per share is $85? You just bought it for 35 and it says it's 85. That's not a mistake. This is how they work it. They take your losses, that $50 a share, and they put it on to the new cost basis over here. You paid 35, put the 50 on top of it. That's $85. You truly have invested in this company because you didn't get that $50 back. So that's where they put it right there, right then. So what happens when you go to sell this stock? Well, first off, you're going to get all the money you're supposed to get. So don't worry about that. It's not going to change any of your money. What it does is it changes the accounting to being taken care of during the trade on the cost basis aspect, rather than being dealt with in the end on the deductions. So let's say here that you got back in you sold your stock or you sold your stock at a loss for 50 bucks. You got back in for $35 and let's say the stock doesn't move. It's still $35 after a week. It just didn't move. So you get out of it. You didn't get a gain. You didn't get a loss. You still have a $50 loss from your first transaction. You now get that loss. That deduction is yours. That is going to move to the end of the year as long as you don't get back into this company within the next 31 days. Now, let's say the stock goes up to $100 again. You got in at 35. It jumps to 100. You sell. That's a $65 gain on your investment. Now, there's a couple ways to look at this, folks, and we'll look at it both ways. Maybe one makes more sense to you than the other. Let's say that ABC goes back up to $100 and you decide to sell it. In that case, you would have a $15 taxable gain, the $100 sale price minus your $85. That is the $35 you paid plus the $50 you lost, right? So you have between 185, you've got 15 bucks. Now look at it from the other way. That is the same as if you bought the stock at $100 and sold it for a $50 loss, and then you rebuy it for 35 and sell it for 100. You lost 50, you made 65. 50 from 65 is $15. Now look at it closely. You got $65 back. You made $65 profit, but you're only being taxed on $15. That's what's going to show up. You're going to get $65 in your pocket right now, but you're only going to be taxed on $15. So you don't get a deduction, but you do get the price brought down, your profits, your gains are brought down. So you're going to pay less taxes in this form. Now, what happens if the stock falls? Let's say it goes from $35 down to $20. 
you're out, that's it, didn't work for me. You lost $50 on your first transaction, you lost another $15 on your second transaction, you're $65 down. You get to use that as a deduction. That will carry over to the end of the year if you don't get back into the company within the next 31 days. That is always a condition. Now, what do they mean when they are talking about getting in and out of a stock in that 30-day period before and after the sale? How can you do it before? Folks, we have been trading for a long time. Stocks have been being bought and sold right up until this moment, and they're going to continue. So maybe I got into this 28 days ago. I averaged down, and then I sold for a loss, and then I got back in. Well, every one of these trades is connected like a chain link in a, in a chain. If, there, if each one is within that 30-day period, 31 days, then they are all connected. So you can't have a transaction 31 days before this one or 31 days after this one if you don't want it to be a wash sale. Now, it does get more complicated if you don't have the same amount of shares. You know, you sold 100 shares and then you got back in and maybe you bought 75. Well, there still is a mathematical way to work it all out and they do. I was just trying to show you the easiest way to think about it, but it is always put into the cost basis so that your average price per share is going to be higher, but it isn't going to change the money you pull out of the stock. It's just going to change the way it goes on the books at the end of the year. So let's take a look down here at substantially identical. What the heck does that mean? Well, this is a gray area, folks. The SEC did not get very specific about what they meant by substantially identical. That is really all they said. So we've got some general rules here, but they're all subjective. And the only ones making the determinations are our individual brokers. They'll decide if it's a wash sale or not. The wash sale rule says you cannot buy a security that is substantially identical to the one you sold within a 61 day window, 30 before, 30 after. What does substantially identical mean? Well, if you sold ABC common stock and then you bought it back, that's a wash sale, plain and simple. That's not hard to understand. If you buy the same stock in a different account, it is still a wash sale. You could have multiple accounts, including an IRA. If you sell the stock in one account and buy it back in any other of your accounts, it is a wash sale. And if you do this to your IRA account, it affects it differently than it affects your other accounts. Something to do with your IRA basis. I don't understand it because I don't have an IRA, but you need to keep that in mind. Also, if your wife or your portfolio manager purchases that stock within that 30-day window. That counts as a wash sale. They all count for you as well. So you've got to take all of that into consideration. Buying a call option is a wash sale, period. Selling one stock in a sector and buying a stock from a different company in the same sector is not a wash sale as long as the companies aren't connected in any way shape or form well that's what they say here but i personally have experienced something different when i first started trading back in 2018 i only traded cannabis stocks for about two and a half three years i was new i didn't know anything about diversification or any of that so i was trading one type of stock well, when I got my taxes at the end of the year, I had a ton of wash sales and I didn't know what they were and I didn't know what to do with that big number. So I called up the broker and asked them what exactly this was and they explained it to me. Well, I was looking at my paperwork going, but wait a minute, you are saying that this stock from Tilray is a wash sale. I sold Tilray and I got into Aurora. They said, yeah, but each one is a cannabis company. Each one is a penny stock. And it's like, but they're different companies. They didn't care. 
They counted them all as wash sales. And I had a lot of them that year and had no clue what to do about it. So there's a lot of things that come into play. ETFs, bonds. Yes for some, no for some, maybe for some. It's all very subjective. So we're not exactly clear on what a wash sale could be, but the bottom line is, is if you're dealing with the same stock over and over again, it definitely is going to be a wash sale. And as day traders, as scalpers, there's many occasions where we get in and out of a stock over and over again. And if you are losing more often than you're winning, this is going to really hurt you folks. Obviously, the best answer to this problem is just to win more of your trades. Don't lose as often. <laughs> That's not good advice, is it? I mean, you're never trying to lose, are you? Unless you're a shorter. You're never trying to lose. You're trying to win every trade. So to tell you not to lose too often is just stupid advice. We have better advice. What you need to do is be seen as a trader or be seen as a business, which is virtually the same thing because a trader your stock trading is your business. This is how you pay your bills, pay your rent, buy your food. Day traders are invested into their trading of stocks as their job. Now that doesn't mean you can't have a job when you're trading stocks and not be considered a trader. If you're trading four out of five days, if you're trading multiple times a day, you're a trader. Absolutely. So the best thing you can do is to change the perspective of your trading. You want to be viewed as a business, not an individual. How do you do that? Well, obviously you could become a business. You could do a DBA doing business as you could do an LLC. This is a limited liability company, or you could just go full blown and become incorporated. They all come with different types of benefits, but you don't have to do any of those. You can do what they call mark to market. Mark to market will have you being viewed as a business and they will treat you as a business. And this has got all kinds of advantages, including the elimination of wash sales 100%. I've come to a CPA's page here. He is licensed. He has publicly put this information out there. So I'm relying on this being valid information. Hidden among the countless rules of the Internal Revenue Code lies a provision that extends huge advantages to certain taxpayers. Yet many practitioners are apparently unfamiliar with it. The provision offering these underused advantages are in SEC 475, which allow taxpayers to make what is known as the mark to market election. This is something you do on your own. You are going to file form 475 with IRS with your taxes. This is going to set you up for the next year. This is looking forward plan. It's not something you can do at any point in time of the year and you can't quit any point in time of the year. This is done at the time of your taxes. Also, you need to notify your broker, but you can notify your broker. I think it's up to the last day of the year or the first day of the next year, which I read there are some advantages to letting IRS know that you're going MTM mark to market and not let your broker know, but I'm not quite sure what that is. They tell us here that in short, if an individual qualifies and makes the election, he or she is allowed to treat the losses from the sales of stocks and other securities as ordinary rather than capital losses, a tremendous opportunity for those who are eligible in basic terms, folks, Anything you lose is a deduction. Anything you gain is taxable. And there's no playing with the numbers. It's just like a business. I have losses, I have gains. Just that simple. 
The tax treatment of those who buy and sell taxes and other securities is not the same for all taxpayers. It can vary depending on whether a taxpayer is considered a dealer, an investor, or a trader. In addition, taxpayers who are considered traders are entitled to make the SEC 475 election to use the mark to market rules. Any gain or loss recognized under this rule is taxed as ordinary income, ordinary loss. No big difference in any other taxes you've been filing. Dealers and traders expenses are considered business expenses and are deductible subject to any special rule or limitation. So now you've got your business deduction for your office at home, for your computers, for your internet service, Anything you have to have to do your day trading is now a deduction. Your home office is no problem now. If you're a day trader after COVID, you get that deduction very, very easily. But this is the biggest difference I'm about to point out right now, folks. This is the part you have to consider the most. Under the mark to market rules, Dealers and eligible traders are treated as having sold all their securities on the last day of the tax year at fair market value, causing gain or loss to be taken into account for the year. Let me explain this to you folks. You have your trading activity. You've been buying and selling stocks all year. You've got some losses. You've got some gains. December 29th and or whatever the last market day of the year is, that day, when the market closes, they are going to treat your entire portfolio as if you sold it. Fair market value. So any stocks that have losses that are not sold are going to be considered sold and those losses are going on the board. And any stocks you've taken gains in but haven't sold, those are going to be treated as if you did sell them. So you're going to have all these gains and all these losses kind of like a supermarket. When a supermarket has tax period come, they just don't look at the books and the money in the bank and the money in the registers. They also look at the goods on the shelves. All of that is considered part of the business. Your stocks are your business. So they actually give them a fair market value so they can see how you stand at the end of the year. Now, of course, they really aren't sold, but this is how it's done. So you've got to take that into consideration. Are you going to have enough losses to offset your capital gains? If you've had a very strong year and had very little losses, that could be detrimental to you. It could be. So I've got to tell you in a very loud voice, talk to your tax professionals, talk to your brokers, folks. I don't have all the information on these topics. I am neither a licensed tax preparer. I am neither a licensed broker. I don't know all the information and I can't tell you what to do, but I am bringing it to your attention so that you are aware of it. So let's get some information here about the advantages to MTM, mark to market. The tax treatment of a trader's transactions is similar to that for an investor, but varies in several important respects. First and foremost, a taxpayer who is considered a trader is treated as carrying on a trade or a business. And that's completely different than all the other traders. You are just going to have profits and losses. That simple folks. And at the end of the year, you get a fair market value for what your portfolio is worth. Now, if you have margin accounts, there are considerations as well as benefits. A trader's margin accounts interest is no longer investment interest subject to limitation under the SEC 153, but rather business interest deductible without limitation. This may enable the taxpayer to deduct significant amounts of interest that otherwise might be limited. In addition, a trader can rake the SEC 179 expense deduction because the trader meets the active trader business requirement. Likewise, the trader may qualify for the home office deduction in that the home qualifies for one of the exemptions under the 280 in business use. A trader is also entitled to set up a qualified retirement plan while investors are not. 
So there's a lot of applications here, folks, and this is why you need somebody who can explain this to you. But that's another very important fact I need to say. A lot of tax people do not understand the MTM. They don't know it fully and you're going to be liable. It doesn't matter if you have an accountant prepare your taxes. You're liable for whatever he puts on those papers, even if you didn't understand what he put down there. So make sure your accountant understands what mark to market really is. One of the important things that I noticed is that once you go to MTM, you are not subject to self-employment tax owing to the rule that dividends, interest from securities, and gains or losses from sales of capital assets are not considered self-employment income. That was my biggest thing last year. I was a trader. I got my tax deductions down. I was able to get my federal taxes way, way down, but my self-employment tax was way, way up. And I didn't know how to get that freaking down. Doing MTM, you have no self-employment tax. You don't have to pay the social security from this. How about that? As a result, traders must recognize all gains and losses on the constructive sales as that date. They're saying at the end of the year, you're going to have to deal with this. Now, there's something I've got to let you know. As I was looking through all of this information, it appears that the very last market day of the year, the market surges. It goes way up. I think businesses purposely push their stocks up. They want high market values. So you could end up with a lot more gains just because of the very last day. This happens in a lot of situations. So you've got to be aware of that. Now they say this may be a major drawback to making the initial election, to choosing MTM, having all of these gains and losses all appear at the very end of the year. Electing to mark to market accelerates recognition of all gains and losses that were previously deferred. So everything that was deferred for years and years all happens in one year. Boom. So if you did lose $3 million, you'd get that whole $3 million off this year. And if you didn't make a lot of money, that would probably be a very good thing rather than have to wait a thousand years for it. The net income or loss from the deemed sale is added to the actual trading activity during the year and the results in ordinary income and ordinary loss. So again, as I said, everything you've been doing, that just gets added on to your fair market value. It's one big pie, red and green. And then just do your simple math between the two. This rule is extremely valuable because it allows traders to avoid the limitation on deductions of capital losses. By making the election, by choosing to do this, traders can use losses to offset all other taxable income without limitation. So if you did lose $3 million, that $3 million loss is not just attributable as a deduction to gains on the market. That's attributable to any gains doesn't matter if they came from real estate or gold mining or a job. It doesn't matter. You're going to be able to deduct any of the losses from this business from any of your other revenues. So this is a huge, huge, uh, valuable asset as far as I'm concerned, folks. So hopefully you've got a better idea of what a wash sale is and how it can affect your portfolio. And more importantly, you now have options to avoid those wash sales if you want to do that. You could just become a business, DBA, LLC, incorporate, or you could elect for MTM, mark to market. Just show that you're a trader trading at least four days out of five days a week, that you're trying to grab market movements and get gains on a daily basis. You'll have no problem getting MTM. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages that come with MTM, and you're going to want to go through all of those to make sure that it fits you. If you trade options, you're going to lose benefits. If you have margins, you're going to gain benefits. And the only way you're truly going to understand it is sitting down with a tax professional who understands MTM. Who knows? This could be your ticket. Hopefully, I've shared something of value with you. I'm sure you're going to have to look deeper into it, and I expect you to. Remember, folks, 
The more you know, the more you're going to grow. See you, folks.